Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Atlantic Council's International Women's Day Forum. Thank you all for so joining us today. Um, my name is Maya Sparkman, and I am an Associate Director at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center, and it's my pleasure to introduce the next panel. Um, today, we're joined by Damilola Ogumbi, the CEO for Sustainable Energy for All, and Lisa Friedman, climate change um, and energy reporter from the New York Times, to kick off this discussion on boosting climate or boosting gender equality uh, through climate action. And I will be joining the uh, the next panel uh, shortly after this fireside chat. Over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I was a reporter at a wonderful publication called e, e News when SC4ALL was launched. At the time, there were approximately 1.5 billion people in the world without access to energy. Now, according to the IEA, the numbers are in the 700 million-ish. <laughs> we can talk about right, yeah. rises and falls. Where have some of the biggest gains been and where do some of the biggest challenges remain? Okay, thank you for having me first, and it's great to be interviewed by you. Um, I think we first have to set in context. Improvements have happened. This year, we're looking at, um, I think the figure is about 690 million people that don't have access to electricity. That's a good thing. But if you look at where that has been gained, that has really been an Asia boost. There's been a lot of work, especially with India. They've, they've done an exceptional job of, of making sure everybody's connected. I'm not saying that everyone might have reliable power, but everyone has access to some form of energy. When you look at the figures of Africa, it kind of gone from about 590 to maybe like 560 million now. So it's not improving at the pace, and that's from various reasons. You know, it's not that, you know, African government and um, African private sector are not driving it, but, you know, things like um, babies being born is outpacing the amount of um, electricity connections mm. that are happening. That's a real thing, you know, debt crisis issues, people going back into extreme poverty. So when we look at the information, I don't think we should kind of clap our hands and say, oh yes, we've improved. We can do this, sorry. <laughs> Hello, great. Um, we, should, we should also focus on, <laughs> we should also focus on where these gains are and, and the countries that are dealing with that. The other area I want to touch on, because people seem to forget it, is the um, we're not very doing very well with access to clean cooking. We still have about 2.3 billion people without any access at all, and about 900 million of those reside in Africa. And it's currently, um, according to WHO, the indoor air pollution is the fifth largest cause of death of an African woman. So it's, it's, it's a really terrible situation right now. Wow. So we're, we're closing it on, on the related issue, which is what does lack of energy access mean for women and for girls? I mean, lack of energy access means having any type of life. You will not be able to live a dignified life if you do not have access to electricity and clean cooking, or if you have access to clean cooking, but you still have to rely on fuel wood. So to put it in perspective, if I take clean cooking, clean cooking, um, on the average, I guess, vulnerable woman, spends about four and a half hours to five hours a day between collecting fuel wood, bringing fuel wood, burning fuel wood, burning that fuel wood again to, to make charcoal for the family. Um, and in that whole value chain, the, the level of gender-based violence to collect the fuel wood and back is just, it's, I mean, the figures that we were seeing in, um, in Southern Africa was, um, seven out of ten women are likely to be raped on the way to get fuel wood. Wow. And I think it's really important to give this context because when we talk about it, we just think we're just switching people to a better source of energy. These are really, really horrible things. And there's also the, the link of having gender-based violence in your home with your spouse by not having food ready on time. So it's a lose-lose situation all around, apart from the fact of the, you know, you're inhaling all these terrible fumes and their children running around, which, which, which causes them to also feel the effects of it. So that, that is awful. We also, on the good side, is we know when we connect a woman, particularly, to um, constant electricity, about 40% of them end up having a business. Huh. either within the home, around the home, something. So it's also the knock-on effect of what is that GDP growth because you're connecting a woman, which is not the same stats with the man. The man is only about 18%. Um, what, what accounts for that difference? Just women are just more 
they're just better. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, they're better. They're better, bo better board members. They're just better at stuff. They don't steal as much as men in terms of company structures. You know, the stats, the, the stats are there. Um, and again, having access to electricity um, tools um, also means renewable energy, especially if you're working in that space, you're more likely to be on par with your male counterpart, which there are very few um, sectors that allow you to do that. Yeah. So it's not a, you know, nice to have. It's something that is, you know, I just find it ridiculous that we're still talking about it and we're not linking it to climate issues and we still believe having, what, 300 million women by 20. 30 without access to electricity at all, we will achieve our climate goals. It just can't happen. The FAO just recently came out with a study showing uh, the disproportionate burden that uh, heat waves and extreme heat has on female-led households. When you layer climate change on top of a lack of energy access, you know what, what else are we seeing for, for women and girls um, and what you know, what is, what is how, how do we, you know, you, you're, you said it, we, we can't meet our climate goals without meeting our, our energy access goals. How does it hurt uh, the ability to, to meet these, all these other important goals? Um, it hurts the ability because not investing in women actually hurts the society. Yeah. Like if you only thought about the economics and you didn't care about climate, investing in women is actually better for your society. GDP wise, so there's there's just that angle. It's just again, it's mass. You know, for you to just calculate what would it take to to take these women and train them and develop them. Um, it's also important to to marry on the fact that this um, use of fuel wood is causing massive deforestation. So apart from heat waves, we're seeing floods like we've never seen it before. And because these localities sometimes are not, you know, open to the press yeah. and things like that, the, the, the migration figures in new forms of climate refugees, all these other things disproportionately affect women and children because they're the ones moving around and moving around, or the man goes first and things like that. So it, it's, 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 it's destabilizing their, their entire world. You now have communities, especially in West and East Africa, just constantly moving, just constantly moving. And some of the children have never known where they actually come from. And it is because of climate-related issues that are affecting it. So it's not like, oh, it's really hot. I don't have a fan or an AC. It's more in terms of this has destroyed my whole agricultural base. I cannot farm anymore. I have to physically leave an environment I've known all my life to move somewhere else. So if you can't meet energy access needs, then it also becomes harder to meet health needs, education, housing, all of the other, either whether they're SDG goals or, or just human I mean, rights. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a pin, and I should have worn it today, where energy is at the center mm -hmm. of everything we do. Because you, if you do not meet energy needs, um, you do. You will not meet at least two thirds of 169 SDG goals, oh. right? So, yeah. you know, looking at this issue of clean cooking as a health crisis as well is very, very important. But um, the the gender figures are just they're just really, really daunting because these women only want to prepare food for their families. You know, <laughs> when it is hard for people like us to relate that because I want to provide food for my children, I am dying. You know, and I think it's really important for us that everybody in this room is at such a privileged position just because you're in this room. And that context and not that understanding of what is actually happening in real time on ground is, is just as terrifying as all these awful wars or conflicts that are going through. And it's the cause of a lot of conflicts as well that's happening um, on the continent. I think maybe we think, maybe I think, that by providing energy access to communities, you are implicitly uh, providing energy access to women and girls. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Is there, are there special, you know, are there specific needs that, that need to be met when we're thinking about gender and energy access? Absolutely. Um, so it doesn't mean that. What we've seen um, for many years is you have these amazing electrification projects. Yeah. So they electrify the home, but the, the source of energy for cooking is still fuel wood. So you're not, yeah, they might have you know, some, uh, you know, a system of electrification, but it's still fuel wood. The other thing that people have to understand, it's not about just electrifying people, it's the minimum level of electricity to need, you need to live a dignified life. So I just want to break that in perspective. We feel that that number is about a thousand kilowatt hours. 
For people who don't understand kilowatt hours, the average American uses 13,000 kilowatt hours. So we're asking for the equivalent of an American fridge. <laughs> just, it's just easier. Wow. Just an easier way to, to, to say it. And the global average is about you know, 3,000 or 4,000, wherever you are, right? Being in the installed capacity of Sub-Saharan Africa, but if you take away South Africa, gives every single African is living in energy poverty because they have 400 kilowatt hours. I, I, I like to break it down because it's not about just giving electricity. And you know, if I see one more picture of a solar lantern and 20 women around it and they're smiling and everyone claps like someone's done anything, you didn't give them electricity first, you gave them light. And that light cannot do anything for them. You need to give enough electricity to power a small fan, to power a fridge, to run something. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to push for. So it's not OK for you to say, I've, I've done this and clap and you know, take pictures. It's what is that sustainable model? And that sustainable model has to include like decentralized energy solutions. It has to include training women and girls to be able to operate these systems. Yeah. Right. So a perfect example is when in Nigeria, when I was the head of um, what is what is and was as well. Sorry, it's gone bigger now. Largest energy access program in Africa. It was very, very important to me to make sure that every single company that applied to be part of the program showed me their percentage of, of women. It wasn't a mm. you, you can't even get through to the next round if you do not show me what is your gender profile. And it's not no offense, the admin assistant of this, and they got like 10 of those guys, is who is managing. And, and that, that program has been really successful because we probably have the largest amount of African-led solar businesses because you've insisted that it's as a sovereign from the start. Is that program unique in that it asks? Absolutely, the... because some other countries are scared to ask the World Bank to make it a condition, mm -hmm. or the AFDB, or whatever. Or the one that I love the most is, we don't know any women. It's actually, we don't, we, know, we don't know the women. So, I mean, Anita's here because she headed um, that, that part of the program um, for, for us at the time of the REA. We said, no problem, we'll train them. So we just took everyone, what do you need? You need solar installers, you need this, you need that. And we took them, we trained them, and we gave them to them because they don't know where women are. So that's a replicable program. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, what I wouldn't, um, just on a lighter note, what I wouldn't say it was replica, was me walking on top of a ladder in a village to show a bunch of fathers that their children could be, that girls could be solar panel installers, because I was really scared about that. But sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do to get women in programs. What was the um, But they just did not believe. They said women cannot climb ladders. And I just kept on seeing it in all these communities. So I had to physically go video myself. Everyone clapped, and I was praying as I was going on top of there. They gave me the panel put it down and run down just to show that women can install a panel. You know, it's That's those fantastic. type of really silly things, but it makes a difference. And um, we just have to be unapologetic about getting women in our workforce. Um, we do it at SC4 as well. We actually have um, a program for um, gender and youth together, the dedicated program. When, when I came in, um, we used to have programs and then say, where's the gender component? Where's the youth component? Like We do that all the time. But now it's kind of, OK, we start with gender and youth and what marries on top. And that's been a fantastic model. I mean, we have so many young people that are working with us that allow us to learn every day. And obviously, it's me. So obviously, we have at least 60% of people working in the organization being female as well. From parts of the world where there has been you know, the, the, the 500 million or so jump in, in energy access. Are there other lessons learned? What, what are some countries doing right that other countries and communities could learn from, whether it's in India or elsewhere? Um, I think India is doing quite well. Yeah. I think they have women-led um, initiatives around their agro-market, around small SMEs. And, and those industries are really, really important to make sure these mini-grids and decentralized solutions actually work. And um, I mean, the model they have, the corporatives are like a million women. It's, it's just really, really something spectacular. In my home country, Nigeria, we now have, um, um, especially in northern Nigeria, um, we now have um, like a e tuk tuk businesses that's all women led we found out that women were not comfortable having men drive them so from the from the driver to the technician to the uh, swapping station assistant everybody has to be women through the value chain and it's great and the tuk tuks are pink as well so they're quite cute <laughs> <laughs>
I um, I read, and also I'm not texting my husband. Sometimes I write questions on my <laughs> on my notepad on my phone. Um, but I've I've read recently that that uh, gender equality in the energy space is not well measured. Can you talk a little bit about about that? Do we have the numbers to know you know how well women are faring when energy access is provided, and also the number of women in the energy providing space? So I think those are two separate issues. Okay. I think why the figures in terms of knowing how women are faring when they get access to energy isn't, isn't well documented is because there's not enough documentation of what life was like before. Hmm. So it's hard to measure something where your baseline is now they have it. So everyone's like, they have it, so you must be so excited they, they have it. But no one's talking about, okay, in three years' time, you know, she's probably made enough money to buy this. So she needs more on that. So I think that that's what's the missing link. So spending a lot more time on before they have it, so we can see how we improve it and what you can add on to their system, you know, to make them more productive. Because a lot of these women in these communities are quite industrious, right? You know, you have women who cook for a living and things like that. So we've been looking, okay, so what does a, a solar and battery cooker look like to give to a woman who cooks for a living? And so you can only know that when you know, oh, she was using kerosene before. So it's definitely not cost effective. So this will make sense in terms of you know, um, the economic value of it. The other um, side of it in terms of women working with, with different companies and um, um, institutions, again, you hear about people like me and other people and if they get a bunch of young interns, but there's like a missing middle that we're, we're just not capturing. And then, especially on what the- What is that middle? It, you uh, know, a middle band of like more like middle management. Okay. That you're like, what exactly are they doing? Are they just the comms person, which is perfectly fine, a social media, but, but are they the technical people solving the problem? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, where's the pool of people if I have a problem, like I say, oh, in that institution, can we quickly call her to help us out? Because we need to, because there's not an, there's not enough of us. So I think there's high level, low level, but there's nothing in between. And and for me in this role, and I, I can tell everybody, the reason why I took on this role was because I hadn't seen anyone who looked like me. Yeah. I had never seen a woman of color in the energy space at the highest level. I saw like the Amina Mohammeds and stuff who are amazing, and she's my boss. But who was like you know a little bit silly, has two kids, has no work life balance, just <laughs> coasting life around. I don't I don't see people like me, and I wanted to show people like please relate, please come into the space because I haven't figured it out, and we'll all figure it out together. So that's very very important just to even see representation sometimes. Tell me about your work life balance. How do you do it? I have no love. I'm balanced. <laughs> it's prayer, <laughs> and like we say in Africa, God. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, because the thing is. My children are my, they're, they're how I measure success. Yeah. And one of the reasons that drive me is because I want to live the, leave them with a the planet, right? And I, and, I, and I don't want them to see this level of poverty, uh, you know, but I want them to understand it and understand their privilege to try and help. So I feel like it's all interconnected of why a lot of us don't have a work-life balance. It's not that we choose to, but if we look at our children, like, what kind of world are they going to grow up in if I don't do what I'm doing now, at least to the best of our capabilities? It's, it's almost like we're failing them. What are some of the most persistent problems preventing energy access in sub-Saharan Africa? Just not taking it seriously. I mean, it's not a crisis, right? Well, I've, I mean, I've been on panels with folks who say this is not a technical problem, it's a political problem, that we know how to provide energy access, but it's an issue of, of governance. Is that, is that accurate? Is, there, is, that, is it also an issue of access to finance? What are the other It's factors? access to finance, it's governance, but fundamentally, especially I've been in DC for a couple of days, it's people not understanding it's a crisis. It's like how climate is, you know, it's like, yeah, you know. These things happen, these floods happen, these heat waves happen, it's not gonna happen to me. And then when it happens, everyone panics and tries to figure it out. But people don't understand that this isn't the type of thing that one side of the world, you know, will be doing every day they can and another side of the world will suffer and all of a sudden we all come together. It doesn't work like that. This is a climate crisis. Energy access is the climate ambition on ma for many countries. Yeah. You know, we, we, we really have to look at it seriously because it's not even just access to energy, it's access to clean, sustainable energy. You're dealing with a continent, like I said, that needs 20x, 22x more energy. Can you imagine if all that energy is dirty? And I want to <laughs> talk know, about like, gas. Can you, can you really imagine if all that energy starts yeah. off dirty? There's some places that you have 10% you know, energy access, 10% penetrate. What are you transitioning? <laughs> and 2% of 
investment in renewable energy is in Africa, if, I'm, if I remember the numbers correctly. What is the single biggest thing that is required to change that? Um, so there needs to be recognition of large scale projects and connections to energy access. What is happening now on the continent, I think uh, the figure is 580 million, I have to check it. Out of that 580 million people, at least 400 million can be connected decentralized. Decentralized solar solution, that can happen. The problem is there's such a focus on these large scale generation projects. Going into grids that basically don't exist. There are very few countries in sub-Saharan that can put a one gigawatt in. So you funded the generation side, but all of a sudden you, you haven't put the same amount of funding into transmission, distribution, mm. metering, and all the way. I believe you have to have a grid system. Yeah. I'm not one of those purists that says, just go one path. And even the mini grids so that- decentralized energy decent can do the whole job. No, decentralized energy by design is designed as well for when the grid gets there, right? right? The mini grids, should be designed that one day the grid will get there. That village will become a town and that town might become a city. It shouldn't be designed as in it's going to be there and it's a poor solution for poor people. So what should the role of gas be in Africa as an energy development source? It depends on which countries have it and which countries do not and what they're doing. So again, like I get very frustrated when Africa is seen as a country instead of a continent. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. the resources we were talking to are just in very few countries, and whatever they want to do, they do. It doesn't matter what we say about the role of everything, but you're not going to bring something that is not unique to that locality to that locality because you think it's going to work, right? And, and that's why it's like you have to keep on segmenting the issues. The energy access issue, I am convinced, can be done by renewable clean energy. That's not the industrial issue, that's not how industry. It might be working. That might not be how you power your tech company. Or it might be a hybrid there. But we need to segment for the most vulnerable people. You can have clean energy renewable solutions um, moving forward. The uh, Sustainable Energy for, for All has a goal of ending energy poverty by 2030. We are almost there. Does that goal get reached? Absolutely. Why are we here? <laughs> We've got to go big or go home. Like if I did believe in it, we won't be here. Can you end energy poverty and also reach the net zero goal by 2050? If you don't end energy, energy poverty, you will not reach the net zero goal. I think that's my response. It's not possible. Yeah. Um, one of the things we were briefly talking about backstage was some of the, some of the great things you've seen since you've started it at SE for All. Uh, what has really impressed you? What has made you think, wow, if only we could bring this you know, worldwide? Um, um, so first. Developing countries removing fuel subsidy. I didn't think I would see that on the continent in my lifetime. <laughs> Just, you know, it was one of those fairy tales one day. And even though it was a purely economic decision, it just made a fairer playing field when you start introducing new, new technologies first. The second is the growth of um, energy, um, energy transition planning with energy access as the bedrock. Right, so countries are now saying, I'm not just gonna say net zero by one date and do a pledge at COP. I'm gonna sit down and say, what does that mean for my whole of economy um, pipeline? And that's what we've been helping them through. So if you take Ghana or Nigeria or Kenya, there's a plan to say, this is how much I need to invest in this. This is how much I need to invest in my transition, my distribution network, my power system, to allow me to confidently say I can get to net zero. But it's a large amount. Yeah. So for Nigeria to transition by 2060 is $1.9 trillion. And we rally around trying to get a billion dollars for the whole world every year at COP. Right. <laughs> and this is with perfect governance, perfect policies, everything happening perfectly. That's how much we is needed. We only just met the 100 billion goal 10 years late. <laughs> so again, if this is serious, yeah. and this is a country that will be the third largest population by 2050, second to China and India, you take it seriously now that they have 45 gigawatts of diesel and petrol gensets. That is dangerous. You know, you, it's all those type of things that we, we need to focus the countries looking at. And now we have countries in the developing world saying they want to transition. I never thought that would happen. That is super exciting. They want to go green. They want to go cleaner. They think that's where the finance will come in. But on the flip side, they're not getting the support in real time that they truly meet, need. Um, to do these things, especially not from the DFI community. And since we're in Washington, what are some of the things that you would like to see from the Biden administration in this space? 
I mean, I, I would like for them to select which countries are going to be priority and work with them to make that priority. So, example, if you said these are your five African countries that are going to be priority, it's not just about we are providing USAID some subsidy to support Africa. It's where the American businesses that want to set up there. Where's the assembly? Where's the manufacturing? What is the ecosystem? Where's the guarantee system that you can count and guarantee some of the local pension funds and things? Because I mean, I keep on talking about foreign, but Africans also have to do something. You guys can't sit down and say there's a problem. But because of the debt crisis, there, there needs to be all these, these instruments that we need to put in place. So that innovation really, really needs to come. And it has to be by scale. It's not one, two, three million dollars. It's billions of dollars. Um, you know, that's an investment in the market that I fr frankly think is a, it's a really big opportunity as well, because more energy is needed, not less over the next, um, I don't know, couple of decades. And maybe in our final seconds, you could leave us with, you know, uh, an optimistic vision. I mean, what are some of the things happening right now that give you hope? Okay, I keep on talking about access to women having electricity. But that whole EV sector, mm -hmm. the women drivers and technicians and business owners that we just didn't even see coming, yeah, that is super exciting for me. That is super exciting to have business models that work with, with the most vulnerable people, but they are scaling up naturally by just giving them you know, the resources, the space, the enabling environment to do what they do best. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank Round you. Round of applause.